Hello, my friend. I'm Dr. Linda Parker, physician specialized in internal medicine and preventive health. And today, I want to walk you through a question that many people over 40 silently ask themselves. What actually happens to your liver if you drink coffee three times a week? For years, coffee has been blamed for almost everything. Heart problems, high blood pressure, stomach irritation, overstimulating the nervous system. At the same time, newer research keeps suggesting that coffee may actually protect the liver, help with metabolism, and even be linked to longer life. When you hear both messages at once, it's easy to feel confused and even guilty every time you enjoy a cup. You might wonder, am I harming my liver without realizing it? Or does this help or hurt my health in the long run? In this conversation, I want to give you a clear, calm answer. No drama, no magic promises, no fear campaigns. Just a simple explanation of what happens inside your body when you drink coffee a few times a week, how your liver reacts to that habit, who tends to benefit the most, and in which situations you should be more careful. By the end, my goal is that you can look at your cup of coffee with more awareness and less anxiety. Let's start with the star of our story, your liver. Even as you sit still, your liver is working without a break. It filters your blood, processes everything that comes from your intestine, handles nutrients from food, breaks down medications, neutralizes toxins, manages cholesterol, produces bile for digesting fats, and stores energy for when you need it. It is your internal chemical factory and your main detox organ at the same time. When it is healthy, it performs all this silently without asking for attention. When it starts to struggle, the signs are often subtle at first. Fatigue, heaviness after meals, altered blood tests, or changes in your waistline. One of the main enemies of the liver in modern life is not a single food, but the combination of excess calories, sugary drinks, processed foods, and inactivity. That combination leads to fat accumulating inside the liver cells. Over time, this fatty liver can become inflamed, and in some people, it progresses to scarring and stiffness, which we call fibrosis and, in advanced stages, cirrhosis. The worrying part is that these changes often happen quietly over years, without strong pain or clear symptoms. That is why small, repeated choices, including what you drink, matter more than we imagine. Now, picture a very simple scene. Three times a week, you sit down with a cup of coffee. Maybe it's in the morning before your day starts. Maybe it's in the afternoon as a small break. It looks like a tiny moment in your week, but inside your body, it is not neutral. The warm liquid reaches your stomach, passes into your intestine. And from there, the caffeine and dozens of other compounds are absorbed into your bloodstream. All that blood from the digestive system goes straight to your liver first before it travels to the rest of the body. So your liver is literally the first organ to meet your coffee at the chemical level. Coffee is much more than caffeine. It contains antioxidants, especially polyphenols and chlorogenic acids, as well as other compounds that influence how your cells handle sugar, fat, and inflammation. When these substances arrive in the liver, some are transformed, some are used, and some act as signals that slightly shift how the liver behaves. If you drink coffee three times a week, your liver receives these signals regularly, but not constantly. That rhythm has its own effect. One of the first things that tends to change with moderate, regular coffee intake is how the liver manages enzymes involved in detox and metabolism. Your liver constantly uses enzymes to break down medications, hormones, and natural byproducts of your own chemistry. Certain compounds in coffee gently nudge those enzyme systems to work more efficiently. Think of it as giving the liver a small training session, not so intense that it overwhelms, but enough to keep the machinery active and responsive. Three cups a week 
are like three short workouts for those systems. Space through your days. Another important effect takes place in the way your liver handles fat and sugar. Many people over 40 live with some degree of insulin resistance, even if they don't yet have diabetes. That means the body is not using insulin as effectively as it should, and more sugar and fat can end up being stored in places where they cause trouble, including inside the liver. The bioactive compounds in coffee can improve how cells respond to insulin and how the liver uses fat for energy instead of letting it accumulate. The effect is not dramatic or instant, but each cup slightly favors a metabolism that stores less fat in the liver and burns a little more. In practical terms, if you drink coffee three times a week and the rest of your lifestyle is reasonably balanced, your liver is regularly receiving mild support for managing fat and glucose. This does not mean coffee cancels out a poor diet, but it shifts the internal chemistry in a direction that is generally more protective than harmful. For many adults with early or mild fatty liver, that kind of regular, gentle help can make a difference over the years. Now let's talk about inflammation and oxidative stress. Two quiet processes that, when they go out of balance, push the liver toward trouble. Oxidative stress is like a slow chemical rusting of your cells, caused by unstable particles called free radicals. Inflammation is the body's response to injury and irritation. You need both processes in small amounts to stay alive, but when they remain elevated all the time, they damage tissues. Inside the liver, chronic oxidative stress and low-grade inflammation are what transform a simple fatty liver into an inflamed, irritated organ. The antioxidants in coffee act as a counterweight to that process. They neutralize some of the free radicals before they can harm your liver cells. They also influence signaling pathways that regulate inflammation, nudging them away from a constant on position. When you drink coffee several times a week, you are not detoxing your liver in the exaggerated way that marketing sometimes claims, but you are providing molecules that support your liver's own defense systems against everyday wear and tear. It is similar to giving your liver better tools to handle the workload it already has. The next step in this chain is fibrosis, the formation of scar tissue inside the liver. Every time the liver is injured, it tries to repair itself. If the injury is mild and infrequent, the organ regenerates almost perfectly. But if the damage keeps repeating over years, the repair becomes imperfect and leaves tiny scars. Those scars accumulate and make the liver stiffer and less efficient. Over time, that stiffness can progress to cirrhosis, a serious condition in which the architecture of the liver is altered and its function is strongly limited. Moderate, recurrent coffee intake has been linked to a slower progression of fibrosis in people who already have liver conditions. Mechanistically, that makes sense. Less inflammation and less oxidative stress mean less stimulation for scar tissue to form. When you drink coffee three times a week, you are not erasing existing scars, but you may be subtly reducing the speed at which new ones develop especially if you are also working on weight, diet, and other risk factors. It is like walking a little slower toward a cliff while you build a fence farther back. The direction still matters, but the pace changes. Another area where coffee seems to play a role is the long-term risk of liver cancer. Most liver cancers do not appear in a perfectly healthy liver. They usually arise over years on top of chronic inflammation fibrosis, and cirrhosis. If coffee helps to keep inflammation lower, fat better managed, and fibrosis slower, it indirectly alters the terrain in which cancer cells might appear. Drinking coffee a few times a week is not a guarantee against cancer, and it should never replace screening or medical care, but it contributes to creating an internal environment that is less favorable to malignant change. Of course, the story changes depending on what kind of coffee you drink. This is where many people unknowingly sabotage the potential benefits. A simple cup of black coffee or coffee with a small splash of milk 
is a very different message to your liver than a huge drink loaded with sugar, flavored syrups, whipped cream, and a pastry on the side. When you add large amounts of sugar and saturated fat to your coffee habit, you send the liver a far heavier burden, more calories, more fat to store, more glucose swings to manage. In that situation, any potential protective effect of coffee's antioxidants is overshadowed by the damage from excess sugar and calories. If your goal is to support your liver, the best version of coffee is simple. Brewed, filtered, not overly strong, with minimal or no sugar. If you like it with milk, a modest amount is fine for most people, unless you have specific intolerances. The key is that the coffee should not be an excuse to consume desserts in liquid form. Three clean coffees a week are a gentle ally. Three liquid desserts a week are a burden your liver has to handle on top of everything else. The method of preparation matters as well. Filtered coffee tends to remove certain oily compounds that, in high amounts, can raise cholesterol. Unfiltered coffee, such as some types of boiled or pressed coffee, leaves more of those oils in the drink. For someone who drinks large quantities every day, that difference can impact cholesterol levels. For three cups a week, the effect is usually small, but if you already have very high cholesterol or cardiovascular disease, choosing filtered coffee is a safer routine that respects both your liver and your heart. Then there is the question of caffeine itself. Does the liver need the stimulant part, or could you get similar benefits from decaf? Many of the protective compounds in coffee are not caffeine. They are the polyphenols and other plant molecules. Decaffeinated coffee still contains many of those substances. That means that if you are sensitive to caffeine, have trouble sleeping, or experience palpitations with regular coffee, decaf a few times a week can still offer a degree of liver support without overactivating your nervous system. It will not feel as stimulating but your liver will still receive some of the same helpful signals. Now, we should also be honest about circumstances where coffee, even in moderate amounts, deserves more caution. If you already have advanced cirrhosis, any change in your diet should be discussed with your hepatologist or main doctor because your liver's capacity is reduced and your body may react differently. If you have serious heart rhythm disorders, uncontrolled anxiety, or severe reflux, caffeine can worsen those conditions, and the discomfort may outweigh any liver benefit. Pregnant individuals or those with specific medical treatments should adapt coffee intake based on professional guidance, not general advice. It is also important to talk about alcohol because many people unconsciously combine the two. Coffee does not cancel out the damage of alcohol on the liver. It does not sober you up at the liver level. Alcohol is a direct toxin to liver cells, and in high or frequent amounts, it significantly accelerates inflammation and fibrosis. If you drink alcohol regularly and rely on coffee as a counterbalance, you are misunderstanding the relationship. The real protection for your liver is to keep alcohol low or avoid it. Adopt a balanced diet, move your body, and then allow coffee to be a small extra support, not a shield against excess. To make this more concrete, imagine two different people. The first is a 62-year-old man who used to drink several sugary sodas a day. Concerned about his weight and his liver, he gradually replaces some of those sodas with water and allows himself a simple cup of filtered coffee three mornings a week without sugar accompanied by a breakfast rich in protein and fiber. He walks daily, drinks little alcohol, and maintains a reasonable weight. In his case, those three coffees are part of a pattern that supports his liver. Fewer empty calories, more antioxidant intake, better metabolic control. Now imagine a 55-year-old woman who barely eats during the day, smokes, drinks several glasses of alcohol on weekends, and orders three large sugary coffee drinks a week in the afternoon to keep going. Each drink is packed with syrups, cream, and whipped toppings. In her story, 
the coffee is packaged with a calorie bomb and sits on top of other behaviors that strain the liver. For her, the problem is not coffee as a plant beverage, but the way it is prepared and the context in which it is used. The liver, in that scenario, receives more harm than help. The message here is simple. What happens to your liver when you drink coffee three times a week depends heavily on how you drink it and how you live the rest of your life. Coffee can be a small ally or a nearly neutral detail, but it is rarely the main villain. Your liver cares much more about your overall pattern than about a single habit in isolation. If your pattern is dominated by whole foods, moderate portions, movement, good sleep, low alcohol, and reasonable stress management, three modest coffees a week slide easily into the supportive category. So when you look at your cup and ask, am I hurting my liver? The calmer answer is usually, a simple coffee three times a week in the context of a balanced lifestyle is more likely to help your liver than to harm it. It delivers antioxidants, supports fat and sugar handling, gently trains detox enzymes, and may slow some of the processes that lead to scarring and long-term damage. It is not a miracle, but it is not the enemy that older myths suggested. If I had to condense everything we've talked about into one powerful sentence, it would be this. For most adults, three simple coffees a week are a small, consistent ally for the liver when they are part of a thoughtful, healthy lifestyle. That is the key. The liver is remarkably forgiving when you give it reasonable conditions to work in. Even after years of habits that were not ideal, it can improve when you change your choices. You are not trapped in the past. Your liver responds to what you do now, this week, this month, this year. Never forget that it is not too late to protect this quiet organ that protects you every day. You do not need perfection or extreme diets. You need honest awareness, steady improvements, and respect for your body's limits. If coffee is something you enjoy, you can choose to make it part of that new chapter. Cleaner, gentler, more intentional. If coffee does not suit you, you can support your liver in many other ways. The central message is hope. Your liver can still benefit from the smart decisions you start making today. Thank you for sharing this time with me. I'm Dr. Linda Parker, and if this conversation helped you see your morning or afternoon coffee with more clarity and less fear, I invite you to reflect on your current habits, talk openly with your healthcare provider if you have liver concerns, and share this information with someone who might need a calmer perspective. And if you'd like to keep exploring simple, science-based ways to protect your health and your organs as you age, I'd be very happy to have you with me in the next video.